Live from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering DataWorks Summit 2017. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Hey, welcome back to theCUBE. We are live on day one of the DataWorks Summit uh, in the heart of Silicon Valley. I'm Lisa Martin with my co-host Peter Burris, just chatting with our next guest about the Warriors win yesterday. We're also pretty excited about that. Please welcome David C., the SVP of Marketing from Cubal. Hey, David. Hey, thanks for having me. Welcome to theCUBE. We're glad that you still have a voice after no doubt it cheering on the home call, team last night. because I was yelling night. pretty loud yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, talk to us about, you're the SVP of Marketing for yep. Cubal. Big data platform in the cloud. You guys just had a big announcement uh, a few weeks ago. What are Correct. your thoughts? What's going on with Cubal? What's going on with, with big data? What are you seeing in the market? So, you know, we're a cloud native data platform. And, uh, you know, when we talk to customers, we're really, you know, uh, they're really complaining about how they're just struggling with complexity and the barriers to entry. And, you know, they're really crying out for help. And, you know, the good news, I suppose, is, you know, we're in an industry that has a very high pace of innovation. That's great, right? You know, Spark has had eight versions now in two years. But that pace of innovation is, you know, making the complexity even harder. I was watching, you know, uh, Cloudera bragging about how their new product is a combination of 24 open source projects. Uh, you know, that's, that's tough stuff, right? And so if you're a practitioner, you know, trying to get big data operationalized in your company and trying to, you know, scale the use of data and analytics across the company, the nature of open source is it's designed for flexibility, right? You know, you, you, the source, is, you know, source code's public, you have all these options, and configuration settings, et cetera. But moving those into production and then scaling them in a reliable way is just crushing practitioners. And so data teams are suffering. And I think, you know, frankly, it's bad for our industry because you know, Gartner is talking about uh, you know, an 80% failure rate of big data projects by 2018. Think about that. Like, what industry can survive when you know, 70 or 80% of the projects fail? Well, I think, let, let's, let's, let me push on that a little bit. Because I think that the, the concern is, about, is not about 70 to 80% of the, of the efforts to reach an, uh, an answer in a complex big data thing is going to fail. We can probably accommodate that, but what we can't accommodate is failure in the underlying infrastructure. Absolutely. So the research we've done you know, suggests something mm -hmm. as well, that we are seeing an enormous amount of time spent on the underlying infrastructure, right. and there's a lot of failures there. People that say, I have a question, I want to know if there's an answer, and then trying to get to that answer and not getting the answer they yep. want or getting a different answer, that kind of failure is still okay. Right. Because that's experience. Absolutely. We're getting more and more Correct. and more. Yep. So it's not the failure in the data science side or in the application right. side. Actually, it's I would say like getting to an answer you don't like is a form of success. Exactly. Right? Like you have an idea, you try it out, that's all great. So if it's just testing, right. what Gardner's really saying is it's failure in the implementation Correct. of the infrastructure side. That's exactly side. right. So it's the administrative and the operational Correct. It's side a project that didn't deliver an end result. Right. And if the end result is what you hoped, great. If it was, you, you know, even you answer proved the it, yeah, exactly. Couldn't even answer the question. So I, let, me, let me test something on you, Dave. Uh, Dave um, uh, we've been carrying a thesis at Wikibon for a while that it, it looks like open source is proving that it's very good at mimicking mm -hmm. and not quite as good at inventing. Right. So by that I mean that if you put an oper if you drop an operating system in front of Linus Torvald, he can look at that and say, I can do that. Right. And do a great job of it. If you put a development tool, same kind of a thing. But big data is very, very complex, a lot of an you know, enormous number of use cases, Correct. and open source has done a good job at a tool level, and it looks as though the tools are being built to make other tools more valuable, <laughs> as opposed to making it easy right. for a business to operationalize data science and the use of big data in their business. Would you agree or disagree uh, with yeah, that? Yeah, I think that's sort of like fundamental to the philosophy of open source. You know, I'm going to do my work, something I need for me, but I'm going to share it with everybody else, and they can contribute. But at the end of the day, you know, unlike commercial software, there's sort of no one throat to choke, right? And there's nobody who is going to guarantee the you know, interoperability and the success of the piece of software that you're trying to deploy. There's, no, there's not even a real coherent vision in many respects no, about what absolutely the final not. product's going to look looking like. So you know, what you have is a lot of really great cutting edge technology that a lot of really smart people have sort of poured their heart and souls to. But that's a little different than you know trying to get to an end result. And you know, like it or not, like commercial software packages are designed to deliver a result that you pay for. Open source being you know sort of philosophically very different, you know, I think breeds inherent complexity. And that complexity right now is I think at the root of the problem in our industry. 
So give us an example, David. You, you know, you're a marketing guy, sure. I'm a marketing gal. Give us an example of, of a customer, maybe one of your favorite examples, where what, where are you helping them? They're struggling here, they've made significant investments from an infrastructure perspective. They know there's value in yep. the data, varying degrees as we've talked about before. H how does, does Cubo get in there and start helping this use case customer start sure. to optimize and really start making this big data project successful? That's a great question. So there's really two things. Number one is you know, we are a SaaS based platform in the cloud and what we do basically is make big data into more of a turnkey service. So uh, actually the other day I was sort of surfing the internet and we have a customer from uh, Sonic Drive-Ins. You know, they do hamburgers and stuff. Oh, yeah. And they're doing a bunch of big data and this guy was at a, at a data science meetup talking about, and we, we, we didn't put him up to this, he just volunteered. So he was talking about how we've made his life so much easier. Why? Because all of the configuration stuff and the settings and you know, how to, how to you know, manage costs was basically filling out a form and setting policy and parameters and not having to write scripts and figure out all these you know, configuration settings and if I set this one this way and that one that way, what happens? You know, we have a sort of more curated environment that makes that easy. But the thing that I'm really excited about is we think this is the time to really look at having data platforms that can you know, build, you know, that can run autonomously. Today, companies have to hire really expensive, really highly skilled, super smart data engineers and data ops people to run their infrastructure. And you know, if you look at studies, we're about 180,000 people short of the number of data engineers and data ops people this industry needs. So trying to scale by adding more smart people is super hard, right? Uh, but instead, if you could start to get machines to do what people are doing, just faster, cheaper, more reliably, then you can scale your data platform. So we basically uh, made an announcement uh, a couple weeks ago about kind of the industry's first autonomous data platform. And what we're building are software agents that can take over certain types of data management tasks so that data engineers don't have to do it or don't have to be up at three in the morning making sure everything's going right. And from a, a, a market segmentation perspective, where's the sweet spot for that? Enterprise, SMB, somewhere oh, in the, the middle? The bigger you have to scale, it's not about company size, it's really about sort of the scope and scale of your big data effort. So, you know, the more people you have using it and the more data you have, the more you want automation to make things easier. It's sort of true of any industry, it's certainly going to be true of the big data industry. Yeah, the more complexity in the question set, correct. The more complexity, correct. or the more users you have, the more you know, teams which you have, the more is, data sources. Presumably, that's going to be correlated. Absolutely, with the, correct. That's which exactly is, right. we can use a big data project to really ascertain that. Correct. Well, certainty. in fact, that's sort of what we're doing. So, you know, because we're a SaaS platform, we take in the metadata from what our customers are doing, what users, what clusters, what queries, which tables, all that stuff, and we basically use machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to analyze how you're using your data platform and tell you what you can do better or automate stuff that you don't have to do anymore. So we've presumed that the industry at some point in time, the big data industry at some point in time was going to start moving its attention to things like machine learning and AI, yep. you know, up into applications. Are we going to see the, uh, the big data industry basically morph pretty rapidly into more of a service or application conversation or is it going to kind of, are we going to see a rebirth as folks try to bring a more coherent approach to the existing, you know, many of the tools right. that are here right now? What do you think? Oh, I think uh, we're going to see some degree of industry consolidation and you're going to see vendors, you know, and you're seeing it today, uh, you know, trying to simplify and consolidate. Right, and so some of that's moving up the stack towards applications, some of that's about sort of repackaging their offerings and you know, adding simplicity, it's about using artificial intelligence to make the operation of the platform itself easier. I think you'll see a variety of those things because you know, companies have too many places where they can stumble in their deployment and you know, it's going to be you know, the vendor community that has to step in and simplify those things to basically gain greater adoption. So as you think about it, what is, I mean, I have my own idea, <laughs> but what, what do you think the metric that businesses should be using as they conceive of how to source different tools and invest in different tools, put things together? I, I think it's increasingly going to talk about time to value. What yep. do you think? Uh, I think time to value is one. I think another one you could look at is uh, the number of people who have access to the data to create insights, right? So, you know, if you can say, 100% of my company has access to the data and analytics that they need to you know, help their function run better, whatever it is, that's a pretty awesome accomplishment. And you know, there's a bunch of people who may or may not have 100%, but they're pretty close. 
right? And they're really, be, you know, they've really become a data-driven enterprise. And then you have lots of companies who are sort of stuck with, okay, we have this use case running, thank goodness, it took us two years and a couple million bucks, and now they're trying to figure out how they get to the next step. And so they have five users, you know, who are able to use their data platform successfully. That's, uh, you know, I think uh, that's a big measure of success. So I want to talk quickly about, if I may, about, uh, about the cloud in particular, yeah. because uh, there it's pretty clear that there are a number of, that there's some very, very large shops yep. that are starting to conceive of important parts of their overall approach to data right. and putting things into the cloud. Yep. There's a lot of advantages of doing it that way. Um, at the same time, they're also thinking about, and how am I going to integrate the models that I generate out of big data back into applications that might be running a lot of different places. Right. That suggests that there's going to be a new challenge on the horizon of how do we think about end-to-end -end bringing applications together right. with predictable data of movement and uh, control and mm -hmm. other types of activities. Yep. Uh, do, do you agree that that's on the horizon of how we think about end-to-end -end performance across multiple different clouds? Uh, I think that's coming. I, you know, I think the, I'm still surprised at how many people have not figured out that the economic and agility advantages of cloud are so great that you'd be, you know, honestly foolish not to, you know, consider cloud and, and have a proactive way to migrate there. And so there's just, you know, a shocking amount of companies who are still plotting away, you know, building their on-prem infrastructures, et cetera, and they, you know, they still have hesitancy and, and questions about the cloud. I do think that you're right. But I think what you're talking about is, you know, three to five years out for the mainstream of the industry. Certainly the early adopters, you know, who have sort of gotten there, they're talking about that now. But as sort of a mainstream phenomenon, I think that's a couple years out. Excuse me, Peter. One of the things that, that just kind of made me think of was, you know, these companies that where you're saying there's a lot that still have hesitancies regarding cloud. Right. And like, kind of vendor lock-in pop into my head. And that kind of brought me back to one of the things that you were mentioning in the beginning, open source, complexity there, yep. are you seeing or are you helping uh, companies to go back to more of that um, commercialized proprietary software? Are you seeing a shift in enterprises being less concerned about lock-in because they want more simplicity? Uh, you know, it's a great question. I think uh, in the big data space, you know, it's hard to avoid, you know, sort of going down the open source path, right? I think what people are getting more concerned about actually is being locked into a single cloud vendor. And so you know, more and more of the conversations we have are about you know, what are your multi-cloud and eventually cross-cloud capabilities. Well that's the question I just asked. Right, right? exactly. And so I think you know, more and more that's coming to the front. I, I was with a large, very large healthcare company a week ago and I said, what's your cloud strategy? And they said, well, we have a no vendor left behind policy. <laughs> so you know, our, we're standardized on Azure, uh, we've got a bunch of pilots on AWS and we're planning to move you know, from a data warehousing vendor to Oracle in the cloud. <laughs> so, you know, I think for large companies, a lot of them can't control the fact that different divisions, departments, whatever, will use different clouds. And so architecturally, they're going to have to start to think about these sort of multi-cloud, cross-cloud uh, you know, scenarios. And you know, most large companies, given a choice, will not bet the farm on a single cloud provider, and you know, we're great partners and we love Amazon, but every time they have, you know, an S3 outage like they had a few months ago, uh, you know, it really makes people think carefully about, you know, what their infrastructure is and how they're, you know, dealing with reliability. Well, in fairness, they don't have that many, so. They I mean, don't, there is but it only takes there. one. That's right. <laughs> right? That's right, that's right. And, and, it's, and there's, there's reason to suspect that there will be increased specialization of services in the cloud. Correct. So, I mean, it, it's going to get more complex oh, in the absolutely. cloud as well, Correct. not less. Well, David C., SVP of Marketing at Cubel, <laughs> thank you so much for joining and thank sharing you. your insights uh, with Peter and myself. It's been very insightful. So this is great. Uh, another great example of how we've been talking about the Warriors and food. Sonic was brought up into play exactly. here in this. Very exciting. You never know what's going to happen on the Cube. <laughs> so for David and Peter, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching day one of the DataWorks Summit in the heart of Silicon Valley, but stick around because we've got more great content coming your way. <laughs>